climate change is real. And its impact is both substantial and far-reaching. From the retreat and disappearance of massive mountain glaciers to the once thriving forests across the globe now suffering from degradation. But with challenge comes opportunity. And Hawaii, with its unique and diverse landscape, offers those with a vision a chance to combat climate change in novel, unconventional ways. Can modern digital technologies and a more intimate understanding of the Earth itself restore our forests, not just on an isolated island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, but on a global scale? Our planet and our civilizations are changing faster than ever before. Join me as I travel the globe talking to startup founders using technologies to make our world more interesting, accessible and livable. These are the entrepreneurs that are creating the future we will live in. This is Now Go Build. For over a thousand years, native Hawaiians thrived by fine-tuning their lifestyle to the archipelago's natural environment. With the nearest landmass over 2,000 miles away, if you couldn't live symbiotically with the island's ecosystem, you likely weren't living at all. That balance changed when the Western world first came in contact with the islands, introducing environmentally damaging species of flora and fauna, not to mention unchecked extraction and exploitation of Hawaii's natural resources. As the world's nations continue to drill into a finite set of natural resources, startups in Hawaii are reinvigorating local ancestral practices to find solutions for our global future. Is it possible to integrate a millennia of environmental practices and information with the newest technologies, both on the ground and in the cloud? And can those practices be shared with the world? I went to Hawaii to learn how businesses like Terraformation are utilizing technology and localized knowledge to shift global practices from those of extraction to replenishment. Their scalable solutions to combat climate change were not only innovative, they were inspiring. We drove past this place and there was a sign that said, Eco Retreat for Sale. And I was like, what's an eco retreat, right? Yeah. So, so we came and looked at it, and I like sort of stood on the top of that hill and you know, sort of looked out here, and you know, it's like barren, right? But you stand there, yeah. and there's like sort of like, I don't know, it's like a sense of magic. And I thought, like, you know what? We could regreen this place. This will be awesome. So there, there's a very small solar panel here, and there was a brackish water well. And I was like, hey, you know, desalination is a thing. Yep. We can just desalinate this and there, there's no there's no grid, so we'll use solar power, right? Like I had not run the numbers at that point. <laughs> Sometime in the middle was when I started thinking about climate change. Many people seem to think of climate change as being like a political or social problem. My lens was, okay, this climate change thing has got to stop. Like we, we got to solve this, yeah. but it's not happening. So if I were to take as my assumption that it will not be fixed, that governments are not going to solve it, we're not yeah. going to reduce food emissions, it's going to have to be some sort of giant geoengineering project, right? And it turns out, like, if you look at geoengineering proposals and you're actually saying to yourself, which one of these am I going to do? Yeah. Um, then, you, then you get serious. Because <laughs> like most people, they, they think they look at it in a sort of like academic, uh, it's, it's like a casual way, yeah. right? Or it's like, oh, well, this one's cheap. This is the good solution, right? But it's actually like, is it cheap? Does it move the system to a new stable equilibrium? Or is it an unstable equilibrium where you have to keep putting in energy to hold it? And, and then there's there's overshoot potential. And then like tunability, if you, because like any, any sort of project that's that big, you don't know how, you calculate a number, but you don't really know, yeah, no, yeah. right? And so as you get closer, can you tune it, right? Can you observe it? Yeah. Um, and then there's, uh, there's actually like the level of technology that's required because if it requires a high technology base, it can only be executed by a relatively small number of countries. Mm -hmm. But if you have something that like everyone can be doing, mm -hmm. that is much more resilient. Yeah. So when you, you sort of like think of like all of those um, criteria, um, it was it actually became really clear that like massive reforestation yeah. was by far the cheapest and most effective solution. Hawaii Island boasts 10 of the 14 climate zones on Earth. 
making it the perfect place to experiment with massive reforestation. I've gone from the arid land of Yishan's original project to a decidedly different climate to see what it takes to plant a new forest. How are you doing, man? Very nice to see you. My name is Kelly Lee. Nice to see you. Kelly Lee. So, this is now old, I won't say barren, but did, was there a forest here? Yeah, yeah, no, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, we're trying to get a forest to come back to life, but at one point there was a forest. If you uh, look back at the history of this area, actually, the name of the forest would have been called Mahiki. Mahiki. Mm -hmm. And it's got a long and, and, and rich history. We had um, the goddess Hi'iaka had some famous experiences here in the forest. Okay. Um, we had King Kamehameha came through this forest. Is there a lot of historical writing and, and things like that, that that sort of talks about sort of the connection with the land? I'm Hawaiian myself, right? Yeah. On my father's side. And um, there's a deep, rich um, Hawaiian history and a deep connection to the plants and animals. There's two really talented gentlemen, Lopaka and Chauncey, okay. who know way more than I do about this site. They've been okay. working on it longer than I. There's a lot of history on this ground here, is there? Oh yes, yes, most definitely. A lot of mana, yes, yes. Mana? Yes, it's like spiritual power in, okay. in Hawaiian, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And our Hawaiian people used to live of all these plants. They used to be used in their everyday life, so it's uh, special, really special. To okay. Yes, yeah, definitely uh, a legacy that we're, we're wanting to leave behind. You know, there's nothing more humbling than to get on your hands and knees and plant, and plant something that's going to help the future, help our planet. Werner, actually, to really understand better how the forest is connected to the ocean from the top of the mountains to the bottom, uh, I think you really have to actually learn about the Ahupua'a system okay. that we had here in Hawaii. There's a few people I know who can explain it to you way better than I can. So the first person that we're going to meet is Hannah Kihalani Springer. Okay. And she is a kama'aina, or a child of the land, of the Ahupua'a of Ka'upulehu. All of the lands of Hawaii are divided into ahupua'a. Mm -hmm. Ahupua'a are biogeographical, political economic subdivisions of land that come from the ancient times to now. Okay. They may be described also as watersheds. We're most interested in the movement of water out of the heavens, through the clouds. The clouds rest against the forests, such as here at Koloko. Mm -hmm. Water forms on the plants. From the plants, the water drips into the lava. The lava is porous. The water moves underground all the way to the ocean, where the basal springs feed the fisheries, both in our fish ponds and in our nearshore waters. So that's Ahupua'a in a snapshot. So if you look at all of the proposed solutions to climate change. Reforestation is actually pretty high on the list, but it always says, not enough land, all right? Ooh. And so I started thinking like, okay, well, if it's got all these like great features, is there a way we can find more land? So I actually took the most conservative stance, right? Because I'm an engineer, I want, the worst, I want to cover the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. What if all of the land that we could plant forests on right now, nobody wanted to allow us to plant forests on? So could you do it with the least desirable land in the world? And that is generally, degraded, desertified land. For quite a while after a forest is cut down or destroyed, the land can still support a forest. So if you if you restore it, you know, relatively quickly, it will come back quickly. Um, and the rate limiting factor in all cases is freshwater availability. Of course. And so the only other place you can get freshwater is through desalination of seawater. So you said you built the whole desalination plant here from scratch. Yes. <laughs> that sounds impressive, but it was actually just yeah, horrible to do. <laughs> so when we built this, we didn't know what we were doing. We, we simply like said, okay, 45 acres of land will take this much water per day, which means we need this many solar panels for desalination, and we need this many batteries to store the power overnight. Our contractor and the people who helped us plan this out we're thinking of it from the paradigm of putting solar panels on houses, right? That's just what you do. Yeah. Then I realized what we could actually do is you have three times as many panels, desalinate three times as much water during the day, store it in a big tank, and turn it off when the sun goes down. Yeah. And that makes solar desalination radically different from residential and commercial solar conversions 
we can go to solar desalination right away because we don't have battery costs, right? And that is going to totally change the world. <laughs> So, Werner, we're going to go see Dr. Katie Camellamella. Okay. And she is the person who is helping Hana and the team okay. at the Pu'u Va'a Va'a Community Forest. We're reforesting 84 acres of denuded land, and our goal is to reconnect Native Hawaiians with Native Hawaiian forests. As someone who is graduate as a traditional botanist in the Western sciences, people usually grow in rows. And so something that's specific to our project is to have more of a kipuka style. So because of the winds that come down from Mauna Kea, we'll be planting trees as partners. So when it's very windy, they can um, shield up against each other. And they'll also be in like a little kipuka. So they'll be protecting each other. As an ethnobotanist, my job is to emphasize the relationship that we have, not just with each other as people, which allows us to work together, but also like our relationship with the plants. So when I came on site, the first thing I did was come to look at, look at the plants. The microclimates in Hawaii are so diverse as you've, as you've experienced. And so an alahe here might look different than an alahe 20 miles up the road at Puva'ava. And so it's learning those characteristics and similarities. It's like learning the personality of your children. And each child is totally different. And that's the kind of experience that I think we walk with when we're doing our community-based forestry work is that relationship. And it's not just for people, but also um, you feel this wind coming. Mm. You feel, you know, the clouds are basically covering us while we're doing this um, and protecting us from the Kona sun. And so our relations are with us as we film this right now. Yeah, it's interesting because I think you use the same words as well, like people of the land. Yeah, it's not like people and the land is just happens to be here, but you are of the land. I understand that in the beginning of your business, one of the catalysts there was you meeting Jill. You know, what, what impact she had on sort of your thinking. The analogous department in our company to what you would call a tech department in a, in a tech startup is actually forestry. Um, I needed to find somebody who had extremely deep uh, technical on the ground, real world ex you know, experience restoring forests. And that was Jill. A lot of the race that happens with people that are concerned about climate change is they, they want to plant a lot of trees, big numbers of trees. Mm -hmm. We just have to make sure that it's, it's including the whole ecosystem because that whole ecosystem provides support. When you have single species, what happens is they're, they're called brittle. They're very brittle. If you get a bug, an insect, or something and takes it, it's, it's the whole thing, it, it goes. Diversity is really key because it, it creates a system that's resilient. The phrase that's you know, gaining popularity is the like right tree in the right place, mm -hmm. right? You, you need to use native species to that region. When you restore a forest, you begin by planting certain anchor species and all of the other species, shrubs, insects, bacteria, all of those consume the byproducts of that tree and become the, they comprise the rest of the ecosystem. A native species tree supports an order of magnitude more species than a non-native species. Now, the problem is every tree comes from a seed. And so you need at least one seed for every tree you ultimately want to end up with. You know, it's, if, we're, if we're all doing a good job, you get maybe like a 50% survival rate. So you need like two seeds per tree, right? So three billion acres is something like a trillion trees. So you need like two trillion seeds but it can't be any two trillion trees. It have to have two trillion, and it has to be the correct species in every area. So what you actually have to do is you have to bank the seeds in years leading up to the large planting effort. Seed banking traditionally is a centralized system where institutions will collect seeds and store those seeds for disaster relief, mm -hmm. emergency response, 
okay. if you take seeds and you bank them properly, you can store them for decades. We have partners worldwide, over 40 partners in our pipeline. Okay. So our mission is to start building a thousand seed banks and decentralize. We're trying to create seed sovereignty. We want to put seeds in the hands of all people and have them be able to collect their native seeds in their region. That's what we need to do if we're going to plant a trillion trees. You need the seeds first before you can make the it trees. Start, it all starts with the seed. These days technology is integrated into everything. Is te does technology play a role in forestry as well? Yes, it certainly does with terraformation. What the tech provides is support so that we can scale. So my role in terraformation is to look at all the reforestation pipeline from sourcing land to getting seeds to planting to monetizing. Mm -hmm. Look at the whole pipeline and find bottlenecks, limiting factors that we can then uh, tackle with technology or processes. Mm. My background is I'm an applied mathematician. Okay. And that helps me uh, modelize dynamic systems. Mm -hmm. And the whole reforestation pipeline is a dynamic system that okay. needs to be optimized. The idea is to look at all the steps that mm -hmm. are uh, involved in, in, in a restoration project and take into account as many variables as possible, any parameters, build a model, and then run simulations so we can actually tweak and see the impact of optimizing one parameter. So I can change the germination rate, for example. So if the germination rate increases, I see what impact that has on how many CO2 we're actually. So this tells me how much closer to our goal in terms of capturing carbon would we be by changing the germination rate by 10%, for example? Every bottleneck, every technology is a limiting factor at some point in the 10 years that we have to do this huge reforestation effort. We have to understand when we want to tackle a specific problem. We don't want to be optimizing too soon, right? There's also data that are going to help in monetizing the reforestation, a reforestation project by selling carbon credits. In order to sell carbon credits, you have to be able to show that your forest is growing at and ideally at what rate, right? This process of verifying a forest is very time consuming and expensive. We are looking into ways to automate with drones, for example, that would fly and gather images and LIDAR data. And uh, we're thinking of doing this on the edge because again, every seed bank has its own mini data center and then uh, send back the processed information up in the cloud. So what, what are the different pieces in your science that are important? Because terraformation is mostly focusing on reforestation projects, one part of my job is to predict how much carbon will be stored in the forest that will be growing, like the forest that we're planting. How much carbon will this forest type sequester in the next 100 years, for example. Mm. So that's one side of what I do. The other side is going to come when we're going to start monitoring the trees that will eventually grow and go in the forest and measure those trees and try to figure out how much carbon is stored in them. If you want to figure out how much carbon this tree has stored, how do you do that? All you need to know is the diameter of the trunk, the height of the tree and what species it is. And based on what species it is, you can figure out the wood density and that's going to help you figuring out how much carbon is in a tree. So I like to say that I'm you know, a tree hugger because I go and actually <laughs> measure the trees with a tape measurement and with a tape measure. So tree hugger is not a social thing, it is actually a science thing. In my case it is, yes, and I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to look at things on a larger scale, you can bring a LiDAR instrument, fly over your forest and then relate what you find in the ground with your measurements to what you see in the LiDAR images. Yeah, and it also gives you a consistent digital image that you can track over time. Yes. Where humans are a bit more fuzzy. 
Here we have our terraformation greenhouses. Okay. And I mentioned um, uh, the bottlenecks to restoration. One of them is equipment. Okay. And there are many people in the world who don't have the money to set up a proper greenhouse. And so we try to help our partners to develop a nursery so they can really scale. And we acclimatize the plants to the natural conditions outdoors. So we go from seed to field ready. I understand that you need a lot of knowledge to really be able to find the right seeds and to gather the seeds. So can you tell me a bit about that process? Yeah, we go out into the field, like I mentioned before, to sites that are either already forested or have been reforested previously by our team. Mm -hmm. And we recognize the different native species, whether they be indigenous or endemic. From there, we identify whether or not the seeds are mature enough to be collected because again, these plants have a natural cycle. And so some plants may be at a stage of flowering, others may be developing seeds but they're unmature yet so it takes great observation to go out and really listen to the land and the patterns of the land and from there we will collect seeds that are mature. We use the seed collecting app. Um, we take a picture and we take the GPS point of exactly where we've found things. We then bring these seeds back to the seed bank where they are processed. So. The processing consists of cleaning the seeds. This means separating the seeds from their fruits. After cleaning the seeds, they usually either come out to the nursery to be grown and propagated, or they are stored in the seed bank for future use. Oh, oh nice. <laughs> Werner, I want to introduce you to Marion Chow. Hey, Marion. She's our head of Thank seed you. bank. So you collect a lot of data. Absolutely. Yeah, so what, what do you do with the data? <laughs> we uh, receive data from uh, seed collections in the field using our mobile app. And then that mobile app can actually transfer the data right here to our seed bank database. Okay. They're collecting data like what species is it, where did they collect it, what date, um, location information, so that we later, we have that information with our seed bank collection so we <laughs> know how we can then use those seeds in the future. Okay, So and, and so you basically have a whole lineage of knowing which ones are successful, uh, once they start growing, which ones were successful and which ones not. Could then eventually becomes a repeatable process. Yes. The more yeah. data we can collect in the field, the more people will know in the future as well. It was fascinating to see the ways AWS technology supports native mobile application development, enabling companies like Terraformation to collect data on the go, analyze planting progress and growth, and maintain their entire seed bank database. This technology has transformed how Terraformation both accomplishes and scales their efforts empowering their partners to plant millions of trees around the world. So if you open the fridge in the seed bank, you can already look at this. In the coming 10 years, this will sequester 100 tons of carbon. Right, and potentially in one seed bank, you have millions of, of seeds, right? So the potential in one seed bank is, is enormous. Yes. Of the impact. Yes, millions of seeds are like, it, they really represent a lot of potential carbon. Oh, but can you tell us about the water and the sea and the mountains? Here in Kona, we have aquifers. So a lot of the water flows underground, which turns this whole entire ocean very, very cold. And so as it enters the ocean, it becomes now the sea of Kanaloa. And as the sun heats up, and the evaporation lifts back into the clouds. This is the action of cool. And so we all know it as the water cycle. Yeah. But in a story, much like how our people expresses these knowledge, we tell it in a chant. As we continue to return back to our cultural practices, we can begin to instill these kind of sustainability so that the water source can continue to flow. Mm -hmm. And so the chant was um, shared to talk about this and to really inspire the children that in this water cycle, we are able to connect to all these spiritual connections that makes who we are. 
as people. How did you end up here? How did you, what was your motivation to be part of this? So, well, I have three daughters, <laughs> right? And my generation and the generation before, I've left, uh, well, quite a bit of a mess. And part of my motivation is to fix that mess and, and, and just also send the message that it's not desperate. You know, this, it's not hopeless. Yes, it's not hopeless. If we get together and, and, and work on this problem, we can actually fix it in 10 years. I'm a tech guy. All my life, I, I, I started tech companies and built tech products. And I love technology. I don't want to give up technology. I mean, that's my, I'm a geek. I, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm fixing you know the world. about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fixing the world so I can, you know, yeah. keep, uh, keep doing the, the things that I, I like. What do you see as, as the biggest risks to creating your end goal? The biggest risk is actually in the scaling. You can plant the 5,000th tree at the same time as you plant the two millionth tree if you have different people doing it. You can't walk a trillion miles because you have to walk those trillion miles serially, but you can plant a trillion trees in parallel. So do you see that the techniques that you have developed basically to, to get community involvement, do you see that those can be applied to terraformation as well or, or similar? So terraformation, we have a huge goal of creating the most expansive network of decentralized seed banks. So to bring these seed banks into communities around the world and say, you know, enact your processes to collect and plant seeds here. Um, and it's a big task and I feel the heavy burden of it, especially because historically, I think we can point to a lot of examples of people or companies or organizations coming into a new land and saying, we learned the best way to do this here, so it should work here, and it failing. So for example, in Uganda and Ecuador, where there are now seed banks, Terraformation basically supplies the technology, but it's still the community that needs to do it in their own way. I think the communication between the community and us too can, can help a lot. I think we're just as open to listening and getting feedback as we are to telling people what has worked uh, in our area as well. One of the things that we remind ourselves of is the chief is the land and the people are those who serve. So that's our perspective. We certainly extract political power, economic means from those traditional ecological knowledges that we hold, but we also hold that place in the hierarchy of things, that there's something greater than humanity. Our climate solutions must be as varied as our natural environment. There is no one-size-fits-all approach. Planting a trillion trees in 10 years is a monumental but achievable task that will require one eye on the lessons of the past and the other one looking to the future. Listening, receiving feedback, sharing information. These are the ingredients required to solve a shared problem as large as Earth itself. Terraformation may be using cloud technology to design a solution for climate change, but they also understand the importance of the knowledge of the people who will actually get down on their knees to plant a new forest. <laughs>